do it live. All right, uh, welcome. I'm Ed DeRosa, uh, VP of Content at Horse Racing Nation, and uh, I am the only person up here that has never owned a horse, so hopefully I will be <laughs> learning right along with you uh, the highs and lows. Uh, I think it's important uh, for all of us who participate, however we do in racing, uh, to understand that you definitely run the gamut of emotions uh, when it comes to making a connection with these animals. And uh, we, no better example of that than at Breeders' Cup with stories like Cody's Wish, uh, especially, uh, which means a lot to me as a father of a special needs child. So that's an example of, uh, you know, how horses can really touch us. And I have to imagine it really amps up, though, when you're involved, uh, and I hate to distill it to this, but from a financial standpoint and emotional, as everyone uh, to my left is. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, you know, it's kind of dry to always start these things with introducing yourselves, but no better way than in your own words to say how you got the bug to be involved in racing. And I'll start to my far left. Joe is actually the only person here, besides me as well, who does not have a certificate from the equine program at the University of <laughs> Louisville. Uh, all the other three do, and they speak glowingly of the program. So for the students in here, uh, this is what you have to look forward to, success and happiness in the world of thoroughbred <laughs> racing. Not that Joe isn't successful and happy either, but <laughs> they certainly are. And Joe, I can't imagine a better lead-in than that. So well, tell I mean, us about a, yourself. That's a great head start to go through a program like that, you know, and have the network you have to see kind of the opportunity in a good position. I went to Columbia College in downtown Chicago. I worked at the Sears Tower at the time, and I didn't know a lot about horse racing at that point in time, but there was an off-track betting parlor right across the street. It happened to be, interestingly enough, right on my route to walk to school, popped into the off-track betting parlor, got the bug for horse racing, and looked up on the TV one day and saw a guy dressed in a suit and a tie with a microphone, and he was making picks at Arlington Park, and I said to myself, wait a minute, they pay that guy to do that? <laughs> and literally, that kind of framed the rest of my existence because I got my foot in the door. It was a different ball game back then. There was no Twitter. There was no social media. Once you got your foot in the door, if you proved yourself, there weren't a lot of people that were doing what I wanted to do. You just kind of worked your way up the ladder. If you kind of sort of knew what you were talking about and you could present yourself fairly well, they would throw you on TV, and then you just had to, you know, kind of make a positive impression from there. I've worked all the tracks in Chicago. I worked at Philly Park for a couple of years doing the racing network. Got an opportunity here at Churchill in 2015, which I'm very thankful for. Got hired here in 2018 full-time. Became the founding member of Brilliant Racing five years ago because I've owned horses in the past, but I never had an opportunity to help manage those horses in the past. And there's, it's a big difference, so we'll talk about this. You can get involved in horse ownership where other people manage your horses, or you can get involved in a way where you can manage the horses, which is a lot more expensive to do. We built our groups with the thought that we would bring people into the game, which we have, and uh, this is our fifth partnership that we just started recently. So I think being involved in horse ownership helps me do my job as the racing analyst at Churchill behind the desk, because I really have a feel for you know, race is not going, and why horsemen are in this race, and why they're not in this race, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, it kind of helps me become more well-rounded well at what I do, and uh, I love the animals, too, and I think that's a big part of it. And that's a good segue about your involvement, because to your right, uh, Mary Nixon, a retired young brands executive, uh, is involved Starlight, Starlight Ladies, and... Uh, in her own, uh, I don't know if it's a partnership or just what you just have. Just me and my husband. Okay, not a partnership. Just well, that's a partnership. Yeah, 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 yeah someday. <laughs> Storyteller racing, and uh, the Simons also have, uh, I think, a similar experience. But tell us how you've gone uh, and the, the balance of partnerships, your own ownership, and how you got involved. Okay, so this is a little bit of a zigzag journey. I'm probably like a lot of young girls, just loved horses, read all the Black Beauty and my friend Flicka, and then somehow, it's a long story, I won't go through it, but I ended up, I grew up in Lexington, I ended up working on a thoroughbred farm that also um, um, let people board their horses there for $1.45 an hour, so you can imagine how long ago that was. 
Um, and so, I mean, I actually ended up learning to ride, broke yearlings, painted fences, mucked stalls, got thrown in the manure spreader, got thrown in the pond, had snakes thrown on me. It was quite an enlightening experience. And then I went to college and I just got busy with my career. And other than going to horse shows or going to the races, I wasn't very involved. Other than 30 years ago, 32 years ago, I volunteered to be part of the Derby host program for the Oaks and Derby Day at Churchill. So it was another form of involvement. But right before I retired in 2015, we had lived for 10 years, two doors down from Frank Brothers, who's a retired trainer, and Donna Barton Brothers. If you watch the Derby or watch the Breeders' Cup races, she's the NBC analyst on the horse mm -hmm. interviewing the jockeys. They lived two doors down from us and knew how much I loved racing. And Donna said, well, you're getting ready to retire. Why don't you invest in Star Ladies Racing? And I was like, well, why not? <laughs> and I did. And my husband was so jealous that we then got involved, because that's just ladies that race fillies, about 10 to 12 ladies, depending on what year it is. Got into Starlight, which is a gender-neutral partnership. You can be man or woman and be in the partnership, but they mostly race colt, a few fillies here and there. So we got in that, and then last July, we started our own stable. And the difference between writing two checks a year and 100 checks a year is very different <laughs> in the decisions you have to make. And the, I mean, I can go into some detail on it if people are interested, but it's very easy to write checks to a partnership that's got a general partner that takes care of everything. You don't do anything but go and have fun. When you own them yourselves, there's a whole lot more to it. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. But it's been a great ride. And my husband and I are obsessed with it. So, uh, to her right is Gary Palmasano, as I noted, a U of L graduate, uh, I believe, uh, degree-wise and through the program itself. He is now uh, executive director of horse racing for Churchill Downs Incorporated after being employed here by the racetrack, and he started the Churchill Downs Racing Club, which not only I would say was a success here at the track level, but also has served as a template. Uh, for other similar clubs across the country. So very uh, important uh, movement here at Churchill that he helped start. And I know he had to deal with a lot of different personalities and uh, get into that a little bit. But Gary, why don't you just give us the high level of your involvement? Yeah, so I had the sort of traditional entry to racing. Uh, my father was a racehorse trainer. I grew up in New Orleans. So um, I grew up going to the backside every morning uh, with my dad and, and spending time uh, with the horses as you know the son of a trainer uh, my father was was pretty adamant with me he was like look i know you love horses i know you love horse racing um i really 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 prefer you not be a trainer or work on the backside." so um he pushed me to spend as much time on the front side as i could and and with you know the people that worked at the track and worked for the track and, and his, his position to me was, you know, I, I want you to be involved in racing, but you need to experience it from the business aspect um, and, and try to learn the business and why this place ticks and, and what makes a racetrack happen or why the industry wow. is how it is. So um, he afforded me the opportunity to come to college. So I left New Orleans and came to the University of Louisville uh, to pursue a degree in the equine industry program. Uh, while I was at UofL, I picked up a marketing degree. Uh, that's why I tell everyone it took me five and a half years to get out, but that <laughs> wasn't always the case. Um, during my time here at UofL, I interned at Churchill. So I started my sophomore year in the marketing department, um, total, totally interned, totally do uh, dove in headfirst and tried to just um, learn as much as I could. I obviously had a racing background, so that helped me as, as I understood the game and I understood kind of how this place worked. Um, and that's, that was important because not every executive in the marketing teams at these racetracks truly have kind of that, that understanding of, of education or, or the backside or how kind of the industry works. So that afforded me some different opportunities here at Churchill. And uh, right out of college, I uh, took over as a, uh, Churchill has an internship program where you spend time shadowing every um, department head of different racetracks. So I went to fairgrounds back home and spent 18 months there shadowing different department heads of, of the track there, food and beverage, catering, uh, racing office, OTB operations. Um, so really got to see kind of the whole uh, business unit. 
uh, immediately bounced right back to Churchill Downs and have had a number of different positions prior to just recently being named executive director of racing. So um, part of my pitch on that is is the University of Louisville program, and, and I'm extremely passionate about what goes on down the street from here and, uh, you know, always happy to help graduates anytime I can or, or show people around this place or, or try to give anyone a leg up that's coming out of the University of Louisville. Uh, as far as my ownership involvement, Ed mentioned the Churchill Downs Racing Club. So that was something we started a few years ago, back in 2015, with the idea of trying to give as many people as possible the chance to experience ownership. So we started a couple of different clubs that were um, that consisted of 200 people that all put up $500. So the organization was set up a little differently. It was set up as a not-for-profit. So none of the people could ever truly make any money off of the program. But the whole idea was to get them in the door and get them involved and, and get them interested in racing at a different level. So we've gone on to have uh, almost nine different clubs now, so 1,800 different people. Um, our horses have had quite a bit of success. Our most successful horse was a horse named Warriors Club, who's a graded stakes winner, who made almost a million dollars uh, on the track. So he was kind of the poster boy for the program. Um, and I think we, we, we kick-started a lot of the micro-share ownership groups. And, and it was a way for people to put up a fairly nominal amount of money, 500 bucks. And Churchill Downs backed it, so I think people thought it gave it a lot of legitimacy. Um, and we were able to afford those people tons of opportunities with paddock visits and barn area tours and, and just really allowed them to immerse themselves in the game. And it paid off because we've had over 100 people that have gone on to, to either join other syndicates or participate in Starlight or participate in Brilliant. Um, and that was the whole goal, to take people that have never, ever even been to a racetrack and get them in at the next level. So that's my ownership experience. All right. And, uh, to my left is Tammy Simon, who with her husband is with uh, WSS Racing, is that correct? Yeah, and they also had some partnership experience before striking out on their own, so to speak, and a big splash, to say the least, to have a Kentucky Derby starter under their own colors mm -hmm. uh, this year with Barbara Road, named after where you grew up, and yeah. uh, it's a great story, and a uh, horse I actually uh, liked a little bit in this year's Derby, but uh, oh, what, a th <laughs> what a thrill to, to be able to, to have that as uh, one of your first horses yeah. and is your own owner, and how did you get to that point? Oh, wow. Well, um, I've loved horses my whole life and always begged for one, and I got a motorcycle. <laughs> my, my dad said, that's a lot cheaper than a horse. <laughs> so anyway, um, my husband worked with Walmart for many years, and he was gone a lot and traveled. So when he retired, we, we said, we're going to try some stuff together, do, do some things together. Some friends of ours in Arkansas uh, introduced us to horse racing. We bought 10% of a city zip cult named Zip, named zip Your Lip, and we were <laughs> hooked. I was hooked on the animals because I loved them, and my husband is a numbers guy, and there are a lot of numbers <laughs> in horse racing, and he was just, he was hooked from then on. Um, so yeah, we started out with uh, uh, several partners, really the same, I guess, four partners, and we still have horses with them. In fact, we have one running tomorrow with, uh, the same partners, but um, what we wanted to do, we started thinking about um, how to do it just a little bit differently, and, and we created this business uh, program and, and looked at weanlings. We started going to the sales, and you know, if you go buy a two-year-old, you're going to spend millions to try to get a, a good horse. The yearling is fiercely competitive at the sales. So we backed up to the weanlings and we were like, you can get some good weanlings for you know not as much money. So that's how we started. We started looking at different ways to do that. And it's kind of like a ladder system. So we have like uh, five or six weanlings and then you know as the years, it's taken us, I think this is our third or fourth year um, doing this system. And, and um, so now we have like a little set of weanlings, yearlings and two year olds. And so we, we go to the sales and we figure out what we need and we might sell a couple to, to fund the rest of the group. And then we got lucky with Barbara Road. He was a weanling that we found. Uh, that was our first crop, actually, that we did that way. Uh, we had to leave the sale and we told our bloodstock agent, have fun, find us a colt that we can have fun with. So he picked two colts. 
a Barber Road and Big Boss Ben was the other one. And, um, you know, our trainer didn't even like Barber Road for a while. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what's up with this horse. You know, some days he would do well and some days not. And, and then he just, but the interesting thing, our trainer trained, helped train the sire to Barber Road, who was race day. And he kept saying, you know, the older, the older race day got, the better he got. So it was really neat. We, we've done some interesting things and the Derby was amazing. It was just amazing. So. All right, well, we'll so. certainly uh, talk more about that because we also have a, a Derby winner uh, on the panel, which uh, obviously is the ultimate when it comes to racing. But before you could ever get to that point, and I'm a horse player, so my financial uh, backing is through the windows, but I have found in my time in the industry a lot of common ground with owners because it is a gamble uh, when you decide to invest in horses, whether it's from a wagering standpoint or their actual bloodstock. Joe, from a standpoint of having a partnership, dealing with people who might be brand new, new to it, newish, whatever, what sort of guidance do you provide when it comes to making sure people understand the financial commitment, the risks, if it's even right for them? Uh, I'd imagine there are some people where you're like, you know, this might either be too risky or not worth what the, the stress from what the money might mean to them. What sort of, com how do those conversations go with people looking to get into horse ownership? When you, when you have a partnership like ours and we have about 45 members per partnership, the group has evolved from buying two-year-olds in training to now buying yearlings. We had success with the two-year-olds in training, but they come out of the sale, they're prepped really hard for the sale, mm -hmm. And we feel like, you know, backing it up, maybe we'll eventually try weanlings. Yeah. <laughs> but backing it up that you can buy a yearling and you don't know how fast they can go, but you can kind of maybe look and see how their frames are going to develop. You look at the pedigrees. You're obviously trying to find value. We've never paid more than 100 uh, we paid 150000 for a horse, but that was in a four-way partnership. So we've never, we buy, we try to raise about 300000 and buy three or four horses, normally owning between 25 and 50% of each one of them with the partners that we, we have, people that are friends, people that we trust. So when people get into our group, and a lot of our people have been in all five groups, some of them have been in two or three groups, some of them are brand new, it's just having realistic expectations. Like... When you're putting up $3,000 and you're having all of your bills paid for the first 15 months of the partnership, when you have yearlings, you're hoping you know they get to the races, maybe they got a couple starts before there's ever a possibility of a cash call. In the five years we've had Brilliant Racing, we've only had three cash calls. Normally that's about 10% of your original investment, if you want to call it. So you're never going down a, a, a financial rabbit hole where... You put in 3000 okay, we need another 3000 okay, we need another 2000 You know, your initial investment, our first partnership just ended. It lasted five years. We just mm -hmm. sold Yes, It's Ginger uh, in full at the recently concluded Bloodstock sale. Um, and that partnership did well, but you just never really know. So having realistic expectations, this is a journey of experience. You're putting in X amount of dollars. If you get something back at the end of the partnership and we put five winner's circle pictures on your wall, it's well <laughs> worth it. And it is, and everybody's come to realize that. And I always tell the other people that are involved in the management of the group with me, and Gary can attest to this, when you have a bigger group, you're not only managing the horses, you're managing the people. <laughs> I mean, some people are just unrealistic with their expectations. When you have to drop a horse in class or you have to retire a horse, it's very difficult because you want to give them every opportunity to succeed. When we go to the sale, we buy three horses. We only have, you know, three opportunities, so to speak. If you're there buying 15, 20 horses, you can kind of push them harder. You can drop them in class a lot quicker. We've got to give our horses every opportunity to succeed. When they eventually have to drop, you know, in order to become successful potentially and they get claimed away from you, it's very difficult within the partnership. Or finding them a home when their careers are over. We had a, a four-year-old filly who won a race four months ago and then she ran really poorly three races in a row and we just knew 
she didn't want to be a racehorse anymore. You got to find them a good home. So we found a breeder that was willing to breed her. We got a little bit of money for her, and we found all of our horses, whether they were injured and had to be retired, or they could go on to a second career like a broodmare, uh, we found them all really good homes. So we put the horse first, we make sure you don't go down a financial rabbit hole, and we pretty much promote the experience. We're certainly gonna talk about the, uh, the aftercare, because that's a pivotal part to being involved in racing. But uh, on the numbers front, Tammy, you mentioned your, your husband being the numbers guy, and I imagine in his professional life, there was a lot of pressure for profits and things like that. Yeah. Horse racing, expectation, always nice to make money, but a little different in what the expectations are. Do you approach it as completely like, hey, this is entertainment and everything else is gravy? You also mentioned a business plan, so oh, I'm yeah. just curious how those conversations go and how you do try to balance hey, this could get expensive, it's not always a sure thing, but we want to give ourselves the best chance. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we uh, work really hard at trying to stay on budget. You, you <laughs> cannot go into this without a business plan and a budget. And uh, what we've done is, uh, I think we're seeing there's two different types of successes. You can have make a little bit of money, and that's a su success. And you can also win some championships or win some st great stakes, and that's a, a, another way for success. But we're very careful about um, what we spend when we go to the sales. And then we're able, when we buy the winglings, we go for, we're looking for certain things. We, we try to lean towards fillies. Um, with really good pedigrees because there's some residual value as a broodmare. We, um, we always buy just a couple of colts. We don't tend to spend as much money on them. And after we buy a group of weanlings at the yearling sale, we kind of look at them and go, because you never know exactly what they're going to turn out. So we might end up with this, this time, we ended up with three two-term fillies. And we're <laughs> like, wait a minute. <laughs> So we, we, then we go to the yearling sale and we'll sell a couple of them because we've got too many and we need to, we need to buy another one at the yearling sale to make up for something that we don't have. So we're trying to, it's almost like a, we're trying to, it, it sustains itself really. And now we're not there yet, but it's, it's getting there. Uh, so we use what we uh, buy at the weanlings and then to, fill holes as a, in the yearling cell and the two-year-olds. But it is very tough, I will tell you that. And um, we have the, uh, um, let's see, the spreadsheets to prove it because we're <laughs> always looking. And, uh, you know, when you go out on your own all of a sudden, there there's a lot more to it than um, whew, keeping up with all the bills. And, and, and Mary mentioned that with the, the checks, and I was curious yeah. how you decided – you have Starlight Racing, you have Starlight, certainly you've had success with being involved with both. Now on your own, in your head, how are you thinking, okay, I want to be involved in this, but I also, you know, the money is an infinite. So what are your goals when you decide to join with the Starlight Horse versus when you're doing something with Storyteller? They're, they're not that different, really. Um, you know, my husband and I, I, I'm a finance nerd. My whole career was in finance. My husband is an engineering nerd that thinks he knows a lot about finance. And, you know, he and I just have this rule. You know, we don't bet more than we can afford to lose, and we don't spend more on horses than we can afford to lose because the chances that you're going to make money are not that great, particularly, you know, in the racing end of the business. You get into breeding and stuff, and whole economics are a bit different. But when I got into Star Ladies, it was – purely, you know, this is blow money, this is just to have fun, it's a bunch of ladies, we're racing fillies, the, the partnerships at Starlight and Star Ladies are small, it's, you know, it's 12 to 15 people, we all know each other, we hang out together, we, you know, not just horse racing, but we're friends, um, so when we, that was how we started with Star Ladies. My husband got into Starlight with his father in 2017, then I took his father's place eventually, and ended up with Justify. <laughs> so my husband's thinking, this is easy. Now, we did not have the breeding rights to Justify. We just had racing rights, and we were in partnership with some other 
Starlock was in partnership with some other people. But all of a sudden, my husband's thinking, oh, this is easy. We're going to have a derby winner, a triple crown winner every year. <laughs> and I said, no, we never even, I mean, we didn't go into it. We, if we were praying that someday we might have a great stakes winner. We never even expected to be in the Oaks or the Derby or the Breeders' Cup. Um, and it just happened very early. Um, and then we had Authentic, who won the Breeders' Cup Classic and won the Derby. So we have had way more than our fair share of luck because, in the, you know, in that world, we're, we're not making any decisions. We're just writing checks. You know, there's bloodstock agents, there's managing partners, that's, there's, there's actually, um, you know, we're usually in with SF Racing and Saul Koeman's Matacat Racing, and it's, you know, we just write checks and go and have fun. But we've had an enormous amount of luck. When we decided to buy, we actually went to auction and bought one of the Starlight horses that we really liked because... <laughs> You know, they're not pets, but they are to me. Um, and Hosier, who is racing tomorrow in the last race, um, was a horse that we had, he, had, he was at Keeneland for a while, and we got to know him, and they were getting ready to sell him, and I was like, why don't we buy him? <laughs> and we had no goals then. We were just going to buy this one horse and own it ourselves and see what that was like. And the goal, again, is just, you know, maybe win a graded stakes race sometime. Maybe if we break even, we're thrilled. We are absolutely thrilled. If, Same when I bet. Yeah. <laughs> if we make enough like we did with Justify or Authentic that it pays for the next year, yeah. we're ecstatic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we did find out, people would often ask us this, you know, because Starlight will sometimes own a horse all on its own. And people would ask us, well, if you own a horse with FS and Mataket and Starlight, does it feel different when it's just Starlight? Well, yeah, it did. You know, you felt more ownership of the horse. You probably saw the horse more often. When we got our own, we're like going on the backside and patting them and feeding them <laughs> carrots and hanging out with them. It's a whole different experience, and we got hooked on that. So now we have Do 10. Do you agree, Tammy? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we have 10 in Storyteller <laughs> racing no. now. But and the bad part, and Gary knows this, we lost one a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Um, right here. Yeah, um, we did too. And, and that, that, is, that is no fun mm -hmm. yeah. um, because you do get attached to them, and they, 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 they don't go home with you like a dog does, but <laughs> they look at you with those big brown eyes, and you're just sucked in. And I do have a question for Gary to wrap this up, but before I forget, I have to ask you, how does a financier and an engineer come up with storyteller racing? <laughs> um, we have a place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, well. Um, and storytellers are southwest pottery. Okay. There's a storyteller doll that's a mother which has all these little figurines around it that she's telling stories to, so we just named it Storyteller right. Racing. I like it. Very good. Uh, and Gary, you mentioned the racing club's $500. Uh, I imagine that's the lowest entry point of most of the partnerships we've talked about. What was the common denominator that you found from the people that graduated, so to speak, from, okay, I put up the 500 I loved it, I liked it, what have you, I'm willing to do more. Yeah. Um, what, what helped them make that step to being willing to spend more and be more involved? The, the main thing was just a comfort level with the industry and feeling like they knew a trainer, feeling like they had somebody that they could trust uh, to lean on, to ask questions to. Um, I think that's, that's my biggest passion in racing and in ownership is to try to be you know, a conduit between somebody who really wants to be involved that doesn't know how to get involved or doesn't even know where to start. Uh, I think the barrier to entry for ownership is probably kind of the biggest hurdle to get over. But once you, you have a comfort level, once you have your foot in the door, you can start to ease in. And I think what, what we found with the racing club was we were like 500 bucks, you know, we don't know who we're gonna get or who we're gonna show up, but we got a bunch of doctors, a bunch of lawyers, mm -hmm. a bunch of retired folks that wanted to do something but didn't know how to get there. And I felt like once we were able to provide them a pathway in the door and they could ask their questions and, and I could present them with a training bill and I could understand them, I could show them how the veterinarian stuff works and why trainers make decisions uh, to do certain things or, or why our horse has to go to fairgrounds in the winter versus staying here in Kentucky. They were able to, to understand and, and feel like they, they got it at that point in time and felt like they had somebody or some people that they could, could trust to, to help with decisions. Because 
uh, that, that's what it's all about ultimately is if somebody comes into this game and has a really bad first experience, it, it sours them and, and they never come back. So for us, it was all about making sure those folks had the best experience they could on their first foray into the game and being people that they could lean on as they wanted to make the next step. And the folks kind of came together and, and what we saw was, was groups of five or eight or 12 or 15 of them that spun off and did their own thing once they had uh, had built relationships with these people and built relationships with trainers and, and kind of got much more comfortable. So that that's that's my biggest thing is just trying to get people over that barrier to enter the sport. And uh, along those lines, great segue because I find you know handicapper a lot of research. Certainly with ownership, there's pedigree and there's any number of things you can learn about horses to decide what to buy, but also the people aspect and. Uh, for better or worse, there are a lot of sharks in the water uh, that <laughs> see dollar signs, et cetera. Uh, start with you, Tammy. What sort of research did you and your husband do, and what was your approach to finding people you were comfortable working with and trusting with your money? Well, we, um, as we got into uh, horse racing, one of our partners um, introduced us to trainers and stuff, and then when we started really looking to be on our own, we started interviewing trainers. And I heard um, one of D. Wayne Lucas said in a, um, a, a talk he did about you got to interview every trainer. You got to make sure that that trainer has the same philosophy as you have, that he is one with integrity and that will put the horse first. And so we started interviewing trainers. And um, we had people that would introduce us first, so we would get to know him a little better. And when we met John, Ortiz is his name, um, you could see the passion for the horse. Um, and it was just a wonderful relationship from the beginning. And then we met Jared Hughes, our bloodstock agent. And I think you start building a team. It's really like, this is a sports team. You, you, you start building your team. And um, so I, I look at Jared kind of keeps us all on the same page because you know, we could go down rabbit holes to how much money we want to spend and different things. And he just kind of holds everything together. And, and, and a lot of it also, you gotta, you got to see what you, how much you want to get involved. If you want to... Um, just come to the races and enjoy that day. That's great too. And but we get to go because we've we've stayed with one trainer. We're so passionate about getting some different people in, in horse racing. And he's young. Um, he's just got a great family. We've gotten to know him really well, and it's so exciting to see him doing great things now for his family. They just bought a house not too long ago, and you know, that is a joy for us. We didn't we didn't get into racing to think we're going to help people, but it just it just started from there, and um, I, I just think that's the biggest part is you got to know you got to know your trainer, you got to know your team, you got to make sure that you're all on the same page um, when you're buying one or when you're going to sell one. And it, it just makes a huge difference to trust uh, your team. And, and, go, and walk through the barn. Just walk through the barns. You will see our barn is happy. People are happy. And John does things a little bit differently. He, he gives his backstretch workers a salary. He started thinking, he's like, you know, they don't have to worry about how many horses they have and how are they going to pay their bills. So he gives them a salary, and it just it's made the biggest difference. And to walk on the in the backstretch in the early mornings, oh, my goodness, when Barbara Road was at the, the Derby, just to walk through and see the excitement, and it's just amazing. Um, so, yeah. You gotta, you gotta know your team, and you gotta develop your team. Now, uh, definitely not looking to to plug anything, but I do happen to know Joe very personally, and anyone who asks, I say without reservation, you can trust the work that Brilliant does. And uh, Joe, I know you take a lot of pride in that. You've been in the game a long time. Do you see yourself as having a a mentor in the ownership ranks? I know you and I have talked a lot about handicapping and coming up in TV, but when you think about just your approach to running brilliant with Brandon and Natalie, what, 
what sort of comes to mind for you and sort of what inspired you through the years to do the things you do the way you do them? Well, back in the day when I was at Arlington and Hawthorne, I used to, I produced a television show on Fox Sports and Comcast. First horse I ever bought in a small partnership was a horse by the name of Secret Command, who actually ran in the Illinois Derby, and then he went down the claiming ranks, we bought him for 5000 and we used to feature the horse on the show. And it was part of the experience of the television show, showing horse, people how they can get involved in horse ownership. The second group of horses I bought into was with a gentleman named Jim Carfagno at horses with Tony Granitz, and it was a partnership type deal. And he got uh, Steve Dahl, who's a radio legend in Chicago, involved. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Disco Demolition, where they blew up the disco records at Comiskey <laughs> Park, and the White Sox had to forfeit the game. Yeah. <laughs> so that was Steve Dahl. So we got him involved, and he used to promote the horses on the radio. So we're like, okay, Steve, we bought these horses. We're going to let your listeners name the horses. So that's when the movie um, Seabiscuit was very popular. So the radio people were suggesting names here and there, came down to the finalist, and the horse's name that won, Steve Dahl, Seabiscuit, Steve Biscuit. <laughs> mm. So the horse was being promoted on the radio, was being promoted on my TV show, and he won six races at, uh, as a three-year-old, and at the end of the year, he started to tail off. Tony was traveling somewhere. Chicago didn't race for two months. We put him in a $16,000 claiming race, and he got claimed, and Steve was not happy. <laughs> he was in it. We were winning races. He doesn't understand how this works with the claiming and all that, and that, uh, that part of it didn't didn't go well, but overall the whole experience was fantastic. So several years down the road, I've always wanted to get back into ownership, but I've always thought to myself, if I didn't do the TV at Churchill, I, or I didn't have this job, like I would love to manage a stable. I would love to just have 120 of Steve Asmussen's horses and be like, you're going there, <laughs> you're going there, you're good at this, you're good at that. I don't know how he does it. But I always wanted to get back involved in ownership, but I wanted to be involved in picking the horses and managing the horses and all of that stuff is just, you know, people are like, why do you spend so much of your free time on this? Because it is a lot of work, but it becomes a passion. It's like more so, you know, you have life experiences where you have a lot of fun, you do different things growing up. Like to me, this is like fulfillment buy these horses, you watch them develop, they win races, you get these partners together, you bring new people in the game, they are happy when you win races, and there's a lot more downs than there is ups, but the downs are, are rough. But when you have success, it makes it that much better. So I think the, the, the inspiration for me, it wasn't necessarily like, like, I saw people that own horses and I wanted to do it their way, we came up with this uh, strategy, let everybody give us the money up front because we don't have any capital. We don't have money where we say, we're going to buy the horses first and we're going to sell it back to the partnership. <laughs> we collect all the money first. You know exactly what you're paying for the horses. We're not upselling the horses. Let's buy this horse for 50. Let's sell them back to the partnership for 100. We don't do that. What you pay is what you're involved in. We buy the three horses, we pay all the bills up front for 12 months, 15 months. So you're not writing bills, you're not you know, having to, to come up with money every month. The money eventually is gonna run, run out if your horses don't produce and start earning, you know, which is obviously you know, something that's gonna come into play. But we came up with this strategy, it's worked great for us, people can get in at a lower level. You know, We've had Mark Arnold who ran second in one of the Claiming Crown races today, got a taste of ownership with us, which is similar to the racing club. But then he's like, you know what? You got 45 people in your group. This is great. Like, it's very social. You guys all become friends. But it's not for me. I want to do my own thing. I've got the money, the disposable income. Love the experience with your group. Understand how it works now. And now he's doing stuff on his own. So we can be a stepping stone kind of group as well. But, uh, you know, a lot of people have made friendships through our group, so you were, you know, talking about that aspect of it, too. And uh, it's just an overall experience. But came up with this strategy, we're following it, and it's worked well for us.
Mary, what's a lesson you learned the hard way? Oh, so many. You're going to pick one? <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, man. Lesson I learned. Well, one, you lose way more than you win. <laughs> um, that took a little time to learn, but not that long. Um, well, losing 80% of the time is successful in the sport. Uh, yes. No, I mean, statistically, yeah. statistically yeah. That's, that's, that's the hard true. part to get. Um, I mean, I think the hardest thing for us was just going out on our own and not having any idea, really. I mean, we knew there was a lot of stuff that Mangy Parker was taking care of, but having to register, having to design your own uh, silks, the licensing. having to, the licensing oh, is a God. nightmare. You, you know, got to get a race that. in New York. You got to get fingerprinted. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, Everything. I mean, I, I mean, it's horrible. The licensing, the vet bills, the transportation bills, the, you know. I mean, we still let the trainer and bloodstock agent make most of the decisions, but there's just a lot to it. Mm -hmm. That if you're in one of these partnerships, that's one of the great things about being in them. You don't have to think about that stuff. You just say, here, right. take my money. Mm -hmm. Let me know when we run out. Hopefully you don't. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, if you well, want to manage your own horses and be part of the decision-making process, and I think that's a big part of why we're on this panel today, like to get that experience, you know, and then move on to the next level. Some people want to be involved in the decisions and want to have direct contact with the trainers, right? And if you're in a bigger group, that's more difficult. In our group, you can go visit the horses anytime you want. I mean, that's a big part of it too, is picking trainers that you get along mm -hmm. with that fit your group well, mm -hmm. that you can communicate well with. For me, that I can go and have a beer with once in a while mm -hmm. is important, like the social aspect of it too. So uh, yeah, that's all part of it. The other thing is never name a horse after a person. Now you all did, <laughs> and it, it, you had a bump in the road with that, but we've had, we've lost two, and they were both named after somebody, oh. which makes it, it that much more emotional mm. than it would be if we hadn't done that, so we will never name another horse after anyone. Well, I understand naming them after where you grew up could prove successful. <laughs> <laughs> That's, roads and that's different. Yeah, yeah. Not, and a, not a person. Yeah. <laughs> Gary, I know a big part of the racing club experience, uh, obviously coming to the races, but also opportunities to see the horses uh, in the morning. I don't know how you manage that with that big of a group, but uh, certainly now is Warriors Club out at, in Oldham County? Uh, soon, actually. Okay. That I could be a recent development yeah. uh, <laughs> or, or potential development. Um, so once we retired Warriors Club, um, he was out at a farm. Uh, he was not, uh, he did not take to retirement well. Um, <laughs> so we, we had to move him to a facility that was much more hands-on uh, while he, because we, we took him right off the racetrack to an aftercare facility and, and it just didn't work. Is he gelded? Mm -hmm. He is. Okay. Um, did not help though. No. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so he's had two more years of downtime and so we're looking to get him back to the facility um, where, where more people can visit him. But yeah, absolutely. Our group was 200 people and, and that's, it's probably way too many ultimately. Um, and we had to organize events and we had to, to make sure that it was sort of uh, controlled, you know, as, as an experience. Um, but, but still try to provide those opportunities and lean heavily on social media. Uh, pictures, videos, you know, trainer sending clips, uh, that, that type of stuff. Uh, we created a Facebook page for the group where people could talk about, you know, throw out ideas. Hey, why didn't we go to Belmont? You know, I could respond. People could learn. Um, so we really leaned into social media of, of the, uh, another avenue for people to get questions answered because we felt like a lot of people had the same questions. So if you threw it up in the Facebook group, uh, we were able to, to respond easily and, uh, and post pictures and videos of the horse. So uh, certainly providing access um, goes into kind of uh, what your experience is. I mean, you know, as you guys found out, there's only 18 paddock passes in the Kentucky Derby, and you find out who your real friends are real quick when they when they all want one. Um, so if, if your experience is you're one of 200, then then that experience gets minimized a little bit, and, and some folks want to do that on their own and, and be able to, to kind of make those decisions on their own. But, but to everyone's point, that comes with a lot more responsibility as well and a lot more risk. So it, it all just kind of depends on – um, what your appetite for risk is and what you want to get out of this experience. There's a little bit of a layup for this group because I'm 
positive uh, all four vary into the uh, aftercare aspect and the importance of uh, dignified retirement for, for thoroughbred racehorses. But it is an issue for the industry and uh, you know, thankfully it does start with each individual owner and your responsibility. But uh, as part of your plan, Tammy, as I'm sure weanling, that's about as young as you can buy them, uh, but they live a lot longer sure than do. that. Um, what was your approach and how have you talked uh, with your husband about, hey, what do we do when yeah. you know it comes time that they don't race anymore? We've, we've had several uh, that have done that already. And um, what we've done, we, we give a lot of them away. Uh, we find good homes for them and, um, or, or another career. We have um, Dan, Danielle Rozier uh, does Godspeed layups and rehabs. And she has taken a lot and, and found other places for, for them. We've had, um, let's see, we had a great story. Uh, we had this horse, uh, Caduceus was his name. He was huge. He was just a beautiful horse. And he got pneumonia. And uh, we had to do what they told us, he'll never race again, but we gave him the surgery he needed. And then um, John, our trainer, knew of somebody who was uh, a hunter, uh, a jumper, sorry, <laughs> and um, got, got them connected. So we got him well, gave him to her, and she found us two years later uh, at Keeneland, and showed us pictures, he was jumping, and I mean, what a great story. Um, so we, we do a lot of networking, trying to find places for them. We, um, we partner sometimes with Michael Hoy, who just sent one to um, old friends, and um, I've talked to some of them before, um, actually through the U of L, through the certificate program, that was something that I was researching on and, and talked to some of the people there. Um, also, we, there's a little group, Danielle was telling us about this, they keep up with racehorses. So we, one of our very first two-year-olds that we bought uh, was Freakin' Joe was his name. <laughs> and um, Freakin' Joe was smart. Uh, he got hurt, couldn't race anymore, so we thought we had found him a good place. Uh, found out later they had given him to somebody else, and we, Bill and I get a phone call at midnight with panic from Danielle and she's like, we gotta get Joe, we gotta get Joe. We found him and you know, we're not, we're not quite sure he's in a good place. And so we got him the money, we transferred him back to um, Kentucky and guess what? He was in the Breeders' Cup, but as a pony horse. <laughs> it was awesome, it was just, it was so great. So I, that's one of my passions is aftercare. You've got to find a way to to give these horses second careers and um there's so many things they can do and um we have a farm in north carolina so i'm always give them to me i'll <laughs> take them <laughs> but they they have like you said they're, they're so they live so much longer and there's so many other things that they can do and so aftercare is where it's at i think mary i sort of know gary and, and joe's experiences from being around them it seems like perhaps the uh partnership model helps with accountability because there's more people to keep eyes mm -hmm. on what horses may do after they leave the partnership either through going down the mm -hmm. class ranks or otherwise have, have, would you say that's a, a fair assessment of the experience or oh yeah absolutely i mean we've had you know just the nature of the people that we're in business with they're all um and it's not just the horses that need aftercare that you know we support disabled jockeys um, the, the fun, I just went blank on PDJ, his name. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, but the whole group's mindset is, you know, we, we take care of these animals cradle to grave. You know, once we buy them, we make sure and follow them until, you know, the end of their lives. And they're, you know, Donna Brothers is very involved with thoroughbred aftercare, so we know who are the certified um, facilities. We, you know go through a process really on a horse you know is it injured it can't race it can't be rehomed it needs to just go to a farm and have a nice life <laughs> or can it be turned into a hunter jumper or can it become a pleasure horse and then you know every horse is an individual case in terms of what what happens next with it 
Um, now, I've witnessed this on the Facebook group, Gary, hopefully not too much on the spot, but I know there can be some <laughs> gnashing of teeth when certain trainers claim a horse as a <laughs> partnership uh, executive, for lack of a better term, and Joe, you can speak to this too, I'm sure. How do you manage those concerns with, oh, I can't believe you know our pet in some people's eyes is now with so-and-so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's certainly the toughest part. Um, there is an emotional attachment to all these horses. I think we try to be upfront about it. Um, you know, we just recently had a horse claimed, and, and I try to lay out the business sense of it. And, and our group in particular is not an unlimited fund group. We have 200 people. We collect 500 bucks. So we have $100,000 to work with. I don't have the, the, the means of kind of doing a cash call for this not-for-profit structure <laughs> of the organization. So as the cash balance starts to dwindle and the horse isn't performing, I, I have to be very upfront about saying it's $4,000 a month to feed this horse. And, and he has got to earn revenue in order to keep this process going. And running fifth every four weeks in a maiden special weight race is not going to cut it. So we have to try maiden 30 and then we have to try made in 10 because that, that's the nature of the group and the nature of the business. So I try to be very, very forward and very upfront about it. And the other thing that our group does um, is we keep the money within the group. So if we lose a horse for 20,000 bucks, that money stays there. And I've claimed horses back at Mountaineer and Mahoning and, and all these different places. So we follow them along. Uh, we try to reach out because when, when Gary from Churchill Downs calls Joe at Mahoning and is like, hey, I, I have my eye on your horse. I think those folks tend to, to try to pick their heads up a little bit and, and know. And, and we try to stay in contact. How's he doing? Let us know if we can always help um, and always be available for, for home after racing. And, and we've, we've retired every horse um, that we've raced. I'm on the board of an organization called Second Stride, which um, is a very important uh, aftercare group here in Louisville. Uh, they've they rehomed over 140 horses this year alone. So th that's something that's really a passion of mine and working with trusted organizations like that uh, where they kind of do the work for you. Second Stride has all the contractual language uh, where a person who's taking on the horse has to, to kind of make sure that they're informed. They interview every applicant uh, of people who want to uh, adopt a horse. So they have a a good idea of that person's means and their background. So using organizations like that as, as tools for aftercare are, are, you know, make life a lot easier on organizations like us that as we try to, to get our horses in the best um, place after racing. Anything to add, Joe, before I go to the mm -hmm. lightning round? No, I agree with everything Gary said because with his group is similar to mine. I don't have as many people in, but after that horse gets claimed, these people still think it's their horse. <laughs> So they follow the horse. Yes. They're, they're posting on our message board. Man on the Moon ran third at Del Mar today. They yeah. follow all these horses, so they're still part of our family. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brandon Staubel and Natalie Gills are the managing partners. Natalie's like, you guys, like, you grew up with horses, right? You got into it first because you love the animal. That's how she is. We all love the animals, but she really <laughs> loves the animals. So, like, she is going to contact, like Gary said, as soon as we get a horse claim, she's going to contact that trainer. We're going to follow that horse. If you don't want that horse, keep me in mind. We'll take him back. All the same stuff. Quick story that we have the best horse we've ever rehomed, and you build relationships and you find great homes for them. We had a horse named War Bond that we claimed. And a few times for us, he was a $1.9 million RNA uh, as a yearling, and they kept him because he was so well-bred, slid his way down the claiming ladder. We, we took him for 10. We ran him a few times. He got hurt. We tried to rehab him a couple times. And then, again, that's probably one of the lessons I learned is don't continue to try to keep rehabbing horses. At some point, you just got to draw the line. But when we found a, uh, a home for this horse, we – used our contacts, and this horse is now a dual-purpose stallion in Wyoming. So he's a son of Warfront, and he's covering three or four mares every year in Wyoming and doing other <laughs> things as well. But Wyoming has a breeding program. They have several, you know, a couple dozen foals every year. So that was uh, one of our best rehoming stories. Um, but it's just about the contacts that you have and just making sure you do right by the horse. 
All right. Well, I want to leave time for questions, if any, but to end on a positive note, we'll just start with you, Joe, and go down the line. What's it like winning a race? <laughs> um, well, like I said, the way we do things where we buy the horses as either a yearling or before as a two-year-old, I mean, I'm going to watch them develop, and you get them to the races, and they win. We had a horse named Steely Danza who was second six times in a row. He finally won a 12-5 maiden claimer at Fairgrounds, and I was so happy for the for the horse. You know, it's the winning, just the journey leading up to it, getting them to the races, figuring out what they do best, and then putting them in the position to succeed and then finally winning with them. Like, you almost feel like it's your kid playing a sport because they're out there competing just like your kid would be. You got a personal relationship with the horse. Most All of our owners don't. Some live out of state. Some don't like to go back to the barns. Most of our owners do. I certainly do. And when they win, there's no, there's, you can't dis really describe the feeling. Because it's like, sometimes you expect to win and you don't. Sometimes you don't expect to run well and you win. Mm -hmm. We've won 16% of our races over the course of five years, which is pretty good at different mm -hmm. class levels. But that's what you should get it into it for is the experience. If you love the horses, you want to go along the journey, the winning is like the reward. Well, I just have to say that sometimes when you have a horse go off at 30 to 1 <laughs> and it surprises you and comes in second, yeah, you're that's ecstatic what about yeah. that. Um, there's, there's anybody that's seen the movie in the Derby Museum, and I forget who the owner is, but, he, but he's standing there and he's crying. I, I feel I thought I could fly other than having my kids. It was the best thing. I mean, it's sort of when Justify won the Triple Crown, you know, we had our daughters, we had our grandkids with us, and it was like... It was an out of body experience. You were just like, it was. It, 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 went, it went on for an hour. <laughs> every I race guess, is like but, out of body. I don't know what I do during my race. <laughs> I don't. I don't take yeah. any responsibility. But for it, it. it it is an indescribable <laughs> feeling. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't happen often enough. But when it does, it's pretty special. You've all been involved with partnerships with Gary. That was your sort of soul, and you were the the leader of that group. So you got to, I sort of spewed as you gave that experience to other people mm -hmm. and just what, what was that like for you to, to be a part of it? And I'm sure for some, their first win ever. Yeah, you're, you're hundred percent from, from my vantage point, having grown up the son of the trainer, you know, I've, I've done the winner's circle. I've done the move. I mean, had a lot of, had a lot of success, kind of dad owned horses, sort of went through the whole ringer. So for me, it was totally about, uh, giving people that have never had that opportunity that opportunity. So I just sat and watched. Like when, when our first horse won and we had 280 people here at Churchill Downs, we had to take the picture on the racetrack. <laughs> Wayne Lucas was getting hugs and high fives, and, and you could tell it, was, it meant something to him because he's done it all, but he's never provided that type of experience to people either. So on those days, I like to just watch and, and watch people soak up that feeling and that enjoyment. And, uh, and and having been blessed to have had that opportunity a bunch of times, it's it's super rewarding to be able to provide that to others. And last but certainly not least. Oh, it's I get excited if it's a five thousand dollar claimer <laughs> to whatever graded stakes there. They are all amazing wins. Um, I cry. I might mm -hmm. yell. I might. <laughs> I, I'm like, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So <laughs> sometimes Bill looks at me like, calm down. <laughs> but it is, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing to see the horses when we usually we try to walk back to the barns with them. They know when they've done well, and they know when they haven't done well. And to see, I think one of the biggest things that I love is it's hard if people don't under, understand dropping them down, but you have to find, you have to find where they can feel good too. You got to find the place where they can win, and that's that's so rewarding. But gosh, yeah, every win is just amazing. We have two tomorrow, I yeah. hope. So. You mentioned walking back with them. I have to ask, what's it like walking over with them oh, on Derby Day? The interesting thing, when they told us about the 18 tickets, 
the first people we called were all our partners because mm -hmm. we're like y'all got us into this and, and we've learned so much from them they they've been doing it so much longer than we have so they were the first person people we called to walk mm -hmm. over with us um john had his whole family wow. jared had his whole family we got some of the backstretch workers to walk with us and we pulled all our tickets together so we could get as many mm -hmm. as as we could to walk with us that was mm, unbelievable the the feeling the people in the stands and they would high five my son was on the outside and they were high-fiving him and and then just to just to see him um it's emotional yeah did you walk over with justify I've walked over 30 times oh, being a host no. with a lot of people, including our own horses. And well, even when it's not my horse, I love it. You've got to share it. Well, similar to Gary, you've shared it with other people who was their horse, and then it was yours. Oh, the, wa uh, the walkover is, mm -hmm. uh, other than watching them work in the morning, mm -hmm. the walkover is sort of my favorite part of Derby. Yeah. Yeah. Except that it's gotten to be so many people, it does feel a little dangerous. We're going to start 18 walkover passes. Per horse. Well, somehow or more than gonna, 18 people per yeah. horse get out there on the yeah. track. Or we're going to build a bigger paddock. Yeah. That's yeah. our only option right I think right you now. are building a bigger yeah. paddock. But the track's only a certain yeah. width. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and when, when they go through the chute, that's when I get nervous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two inches of rain during the day, I think, tempers the walk tempers over the walk. parade. It, it, right? it does. It does. This pastor finally got some good weather. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate all your time and insight, more importantly. I know it's really personal to be involved in racing and for you to share that uh, certainly very appreciative but uh, definitely wanted to see if there were any questions uh, from anyone out there are we taking questions from Facebook Xavier <laughs> Xavier in Montana might have something he wants to say uh, but uh, yes What, so what is the cost? So if you if you buy a weanling, um, you you, you can't run a horse till they're two. So you basically have all of their yearling year, all and then some of their going into their two year old year. So 12, 15, 18 months worth of bills to get from that point there. Um, when they're in their yearling year, they're they're out in farm or they're at a layup facility. So it's not as expensive. Maybe thirty, forty, fifty dollars a day until they get into the racetrack where they are with their trainer. Your trainer day rate is anywhere between 80 to 100 to $110 mm -hmm. per day. <laughs> and, and the trainer pays all of his staff. He pays for all the, the feed. Um, he pays for a lot of the expenses, uh, his own insurance and that type of thing. So that is his day rate. Um, so, so you're looking at you know, multiple thousands of dollars to get there, but to your point, the weanling market is is sort of you know it's still a little so far away from racing that there's a little bit of a discounted price point mm -hmm. at that entry level, but you have to make up for that with expenses mm -hmm. of an extra year to year and a half. And weanlings are a bigger risk than yearlings compared to two-year-olds because two-year-olds are ready-made products, they're ready, mm -hmm. basically ready to race. So it's a bigger risk, but you can get more bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. Right. And with weanlings, you've got to couple of different options that you can do either sell them at a, the yearling sale and what we found is that it always seems in in the crops that we've had there's one horse that pops out that may you know will do all the expenses for all the other horses we've mm -hmm. had Barber Road and um, Mucho and Hollis were claiming horses that have done really well Joyful Cadence is racing tomorrow she's done really well um, and and so they tend to to take over the expenses for all the other ones. So you always hope you got one that <laughs> pops like that. <laughs> Anything to add? I, I'd just say that's one of the nice things about being in a partnership like Starlight or Star Ladies is that you you do have the benefit of the numbers. Mm -hmm. You've got and and not only a Starlight a partnership, but we're partnering with some other people. So you're really spreading your risk, and you're getting a lot of horses that, you know, it's a bell curve, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Some of them never hit the track. Mm -hmm. Some of them, yeah. you know, win graded races and may go on to the Derby. But you, 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 you've got more bets that way than owning on your own, unless you're a gazillionaire, which <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, don't know how it would happen at this point in my life. And I, I, I did ball. buy a Powerball ticket, but we didn't win. Optimism. She knew better than to ask Gary about his handicapping. <laughs> That's a great question. So the three of us balance each other really well. Brandon Stobble's been a private clocker in the mornings. He's got a good eye for a horse. Like I said, Natalie grew up with horses. She's got a great eye for a horse. So they put in a lot of work. Like you have typical bloodstock agents that will go to the sale, and they've got orders to fill. So if they've got 10 or 20 horses to buy, well, you know this, so like – Ours, we got three horses to buy. We're doing a lot of work to buy those three. You know, hundreds of inspections, horses that we feel are going to be in our price range. But I do a lot of the pedigree work. So what most people are looking for is black type on the pedigree. Great stallion, big families, lots of black type, et cetera, et cetera. That's the easy way, okay? I can't, we can't buy horses that have tons of black type on their page with a big stallion because we're not going to be able to afford them, and if we can, they're gonna have three legs, right? <laughs> so the, the bottom line is like, I gotta try to do the pedigree work and find the under the radar pedigree. This, the dam ran six times, she won one race, and but she ran really fast, or she was very promising. No black type there. Or some of the siblings don't have black type. You try to do some like under the radar, same that I do with my handicapping of horses that are racing. Like, we're buying to race. We're not buying to flip horses where it's like, okay, let's buy this yearling, find something precocious, and flip it as a two-year-old and make a profit. Eventually, we like to try to do the, the, the pin-hooking stuff. But to answer your question, I think it helps on both sides because I look for the under-the-radar pedigrees, and it's worked well. Um, and on the other side of it, by doing the stuff with buying the horses at the sale, it helps me with my job handicapping because you can kind of see what's successful on the racetrack and what's not. Everyone wants to buy a big, beautiful, good-looking, well-bred baby. That doesn't mean that they're going to do well on the track. So I hope that answered your question. I, I want to add to something Joe mentioned. Uh, I definitely think understanding the mechanics of the facets of the industry are important, and he, with bloodstock agents having orders to fill, until I actually got involved in the industry, working at Thoroughbred Times, covering sales, I had no idea that certain agents might be working for four or five different clients, mm -hmm. or that trainers or whoever might already have an agreement about a certain horse, and then they're trying to sell it to an owner. Um, you know, all of which is business, certainly, but I, I definitely think if you don't understand how all that works, you make yourself more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I see some nods. Trust and, who you get involved with. Yeah, and, and it, yeah. Like, again, it's I don't say that like it's a boogeyman it. or anything, but I, I definitely think there is a lot that goes into a, a day at the races and a ton that goes in to selling a horse at the sale and knowing the mechanics of that, who's involved, who they might also be working with is really essential to get uh, the, the most value out of your I'll power. just say this real quick. There's a lot of people trying to cut their losses. Just remember that when you're getting into ownership or you somebody offers you a horse to buy into, you know, there's a lot of people trying to cut their losses. So, you know, maybe the horse you buy into pans out, but people have a pretty good idea of what they're wanting you to get involved in. So just trust the people you get involved with. It's a big part of this. Everybody's trying to make a living doing something that's very hard to make a living at. Well put. Anyone else before we hit the salsa bar? Yes, sir. Joe, when you guys build new partnerships, do you recruit people or do they come to you? How's that work? Both, both. We, we recruit a lot of word of mouth. Gary mentioned the Churchill Downs Racing Club. I think we've gotten probably six or eight unique owners from there. Uh, but I think our members are our biggest advocates as far as having a positive experience. We send out statements every month. And I know people that have been involved in other partnerships, they don't know where their money goes. We send out, part, we send out detailed uh, statements every month. We have a Facebook member page where we, like Gary said, post videos, conversations, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think our partners are our, our biggest source of 
um, promotion for the next group, uh, posting things on social media, you know, like I said, we've had several partners that have been involved in all five groups. So I would say it's a little bit of all of that. Who's your derby one, derby starter? We won't get too optimistic, but do you have a two-year-old you're excited about? We've got we've got a lot coming. Yeah. We we actually scratched one today that we're really excited about. She's a curling, and um, we didn't we didn't want to put her on the track today and okay. all the slop. But we're really excited about her. We just got a Bernardini. We got a um, what else did we get? A Gunrana. Um, we've got some good ones coming. We're really excited about it. And I think Mary mentioned that she's you've seen each other at Oakwan. Yes. Is yes. that right? Yeah. I just want to, we all love Churchill, of course, but for those who have not been to Oakwan, oh. I think it is it an is. absolutely fabulous place yeah, for a day is. and night uh, at the races and after. So. Um, oh, yeah, the new hotel. and I haven't, I haven't been uh, there yet. but We got yeah. to take a walk on New Year's Eve from um, the hotel back to the barn to watch the the workers back there they were having parties we got to go see the horses i mean that was a dream that and if awesome. it's really cold you can stay in your room yeah, and look out the window and watch the horses yeah, work in the morning true, which is awesome yeah. you'd have to leave the craps table to have any I would, yeah. <laughs> usually the losses make me leave the craps table sir you have no chips left yeah. but uh, and I, I wish it were a little close. I did the drive once thinking, oh, Oakland's not that far from New Orleans. And it was a not a fun drive. So I wish it were a little closer because that, that was a great double. But uh, it was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Golf stream, eh. Fairgrounds in Oakland have it covered, I think. So. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you don't mind, a uh, round of applause. And. Uh, we haven't bored the bartender to death. Maybe he'll. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's been lonely. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, from our stream as well. I'm sure uh, hopefully the internet didn't break from the bandwidth, but thank you again and have a good night, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you. First thank tomorrow, you. 1 p.m. <laughs> yeah. We'll be out here. Uh,